let's talk about natural reflections. Why are they so important? We know we try to, when we work on, on projects, we try to make people understand that they're really important. Therefore, their design needs to be focused on getting more reflections or sound reflected from the surfaces, side surfaces, back to the side of the uh, the audience. Can you describe a little bit more the, the background of that, those findings and that research? And there's still some research that carries on. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of, I think the easiest easiest way, kind of uh, with the layman terms to understand is that, that we have two ears, which are on the different sides of the head. So if the sound is coming in front of you or back of you or Above you, like from the ceiling, it's the same sound in, in both ears because it's kind of basically coming in the middle. But then when the sound is coming from the side, there's a small difference between the ears. There's a small time difference, and then there's also a small level difference because the sound has to diffract there, and, and it's, it's a little bit attenuated. Then what has been found is that, that okay, the direct sound is, is usually in front of you because that's where you are look, looking at, for example, orchestra. But then if the, if the first reflections which are coming are not from the ceiling, but they are from the side, then they kind of widen your perceived sound uh, field. And then they make it more interesting. It's kind of comparing mono and stereo. So it's kind of more stereo. But if you have a case that, that you have a direct sound in front of you and then ceiling reflection coming from the ceiling, uh, then it's kind of more monophonic. And then it, it's more stereo, stereo sound when you have kind of the side reflections. So that's kind of the, the easy way of, of understanding that, okay, there is some differences in where the sound is coming from. But recently we have also, or it, it, it was actually really old paper from 70s, I think, in Germany. There was one psychoacoustic study that was done with speech where they found out that if there is a lateral reflection, then actually we, uh, like the threshold of hearing that, it's lower so it can be even minus 15 dB lower than the direct sound that we can still hear the lateral reflection. But then in front of you or behind you or above you, it's only like 10 dB. Then you don't hear it anymore. That's related to this, what I said, this kind of spatial aspects that, that, uh, and this kind of uh, dynamic aspect is that when the orchestra is not playing really loud, when it's playing silently, you probably don't hear any of these reflections so well. Of course, you hear some of them and they are giving you some feel of the space. But then, uh, then it's kind of the, the size of the orchestra that you hear is kind of something that what you see. And the impression, like the, spa uh, like the oral impression is the same, that, okay, this is the orchestra, you can see the, the player who is playing in pianissimo, and that's, that's kind of the size. But if you have these lateral reflections, and then we when the orchestra is playing louder, then we actually start to hear them. And we hear them actually earlier and, and better than, for example, these ceiling reflections. And they kind of enhance the, let's say, the play dynamics a little bit. That's important in kind of, it, it kind of widens your uh, auditory image, so that, that sometimes in, in some halls, I think everybody has, has uh, if you have been in several halls, in some halls you have, you have kind of, when the orchestra is playing loud, the sound is everywhere. It's not only on stage, but it's everywhere. And that's kind of one impression that you get from there. And then the, even though the lateral reflections are usually, we, we talk about the first reflections, so they are really like the first reflections. But I think when you have the lateral surf or the, the side surfaces which are reflecting sound, of course, it's also later in the reverberation. It's, they are giving you reflections because then the sound bounces from the walls several times and go back and forth. And then still in the end of the reverberation, kind of the later in the reverberation, you also have more lateral sound, which is actually causing better envelopment. So the sound and the reverb envelops you better. And that's also that if you have only like this kind of, let's say traditionally this, what we, what we call fan shape hall, is that, that you have the quite narrow audience area in, the, in front, but really wide in back. So the, the walls are really kind of tilted so that, that they are pushing the sound maybe to the back of the hall. Then you don't have this envelopment so much in the end also. And that's kind of, you never get kind of buried inside the sound which is surrounding you. So there are not very good holes for acoustics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, it's kind of, uh, we can say that, yeah, they are not probably supporting so much and they are not so good. But on the other hand, some people like more dry acoustics and they don't like this this envelopment because then usually the, the other, other side of the coin is that usually the clarity is quite high in these holes. The clarity meaning that how well 
you can separate the instruments. And then probably, in, for example, in contemporary music, it's important to hear like every single instrument really clearly. And then if you don't have a lot of reverb, it's, if it's quite dry the whole, then it's, of course, it's, it's easier to kind of hear every single instrument. And that's something that some people want to hear. But nowadays, I think the golden target in concert hall design is, is to have this clarity. So is to have this really good separation of the instruments, but then still have quite a lot of reverb, which is enveloping you. And then that's possible to do exactly with this, uh, these early lateral reflections and then high enough ceiling. And, and there are many, many, many architectural features which actually contribute to that, that, that we could have this kind of really clear sound so that, that you, can, you can clearly hear kind of all the tiny details in the, in the music, but still you are kind of embedded inside the music. You did some research. You, you have a really interesting research paper on the ability of the orchestra to uh, communicate the feelings and emotions with uh, the help of uh, lateral reflections. Uh, I thought it was quite interesting, the approach and the way you uh, rated it. So can you describe it a little bit? Yeah, yeah, because we, uh, based on our these, these measurements and these, these oral sessions and renderings in, in our listening room, we noticed that in some halls, actually, when, when there's a, we had a, uh, one of our examples is, is, is in the beginning part of the Beethoven Seventh Symphony, where you have this kind of full orchestra crescendos, where they are just a couple of woodwinds first playing, but then the, uh, the strings and, and the orchestra is, is playing this kind of raising chord, and, and then it's, it's kind of fortissimo in the end. So there's really nice big crescendos. And then uh, we heard and, and noticed that in some halls, actually, these crescendos seems to be bigger and larger. And then, then also what I explained, this, this kind of widening of the orchestra, it seems to happen in some halls, but in some halls, it's kind of the sound image stays in front of you, but in some halls, it's kind of, they are kind of the sound image is widening also at the same time. It's due to lateral reflections. And then we made a, we made a listening test that, that we found out that, yeah, perceptually people, that's what people find out. But then in the, uh, we were actually at that time in the Department of Media Technology, there was also uh, vision-related research, and they used skin conductivity response, which is used quite a lot in emotion research in, in many fields. And that means that there is kind of in, in two of your fingers, you put the device and it then it is measuring basically the uh, the electricity. So it's sending small electricity pulses from one finger to another. Then it's measuring that that how much electricity is actually going between your two fingers. And then uh, if you get excited something, and if there's big emotions, then we are micro sweating or the temperature of your fingers raise a little bit or something. Something happens, but probably micro sweating is is kind of the easiest to understand. And that means that the electricity actually there is more electric connect connection because you have some moisture and then there is more electricity going between your fingers. So that's kind of a way of, of measuring emotions. So we, we designed a listening test that we invited people to our listening room and they sat there silently and then we put these, these devices to their two fingertips and then we played these, these crescendos in random order so that, that because there is, of course, it's kind of quite noisy measurement. And then there is also that you get used to this because it's always the same crescendo, just a small, tiny difference between the holes. But then if you randomize that between the subjects, then, then they do these kind of uh, biases out that people get used to it and, and your responses are not any, any more so big. But then based on this study, we have 28 subject in the end, subjects in the end. And then we find out that actually some of these shoebox, what we call shoebox holes, so where you have a lot of these lateral reflections, then these, these responses from your conductivity of electricity in, between your fingers, they were actually higher than, than in some other holes. And that was kind of one way of measuring how powerful the crescentos are or how, how big impact they make just to subjects. Of okay. course, we don't know if it's a negative or positive impact because it's it's only that <laughs> it's telling that you that that you have some feelings right? and you you kind of react to that. But of course, then we asked that was it positive or negative, and everybody said that yeah, it's it's just much bigger and the whole sound like in musical terms it sounds like more expressive. How did you come up with or how did you find out that sort of uh, experiment could be done 
with the fingers? It's kind of because we because we had the 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 vision the the guys who are doing the vision related research and they had the device uh, and then then we thought that yeah maybe we can test it also and and then then when we did a little bit of literature study study then it's it's it was obvious that okay that has been done and that has been used and nowadays there is there are many others people are doing heart rate measurements heart rate variability measurements and there are also many others pupil size is, is one thing which is nowadays checked and that that's kind of in speech research there's a quite a lot of, of research when you have speech buried in noise and then you like barely hear it then it's it's the pupil size is actually correlating that how much cognitive effort you have to put when you're trying to understand speech in noise so there are nowadays there are actually many of these kind of psychophysical measurement techniques to to study different things but the, the the crucial point is also that you have to have the what what people are listening you have to have them in in good quality and then also that they are really replicating what is the real sound field so for example in our case that, that the concert horse really sound like a real concert horse because otherwise you're just listening something else there's a lot of work behind designing this and then this is kind of the extra measurement there's another topic, another topic I wanted to speak to you about or ask your opinion on the difference between vineyard and shoebox shape uh, concert halls. There's um, there's many of them. There's a big trend on vineyard concert halls, but they lack of uh, lateral reflections more than shoebox shaped halls. And again, in that chapter, there was some really good analysis of it. So. Could you summarize your findings? Yeah, it's kind of, uh, and this is really from the audience point of view. We can discuss a little bit from the musician's point of view later on, because that's kind of a different story. But from the audience point of view, what we have found out, and then of course there are like flavors in this, in different vineyards and different shoeboxes. Not all shoeboxes are really good. There's also some, some which are not so good. But basically, the, the difference, how I describe it, is, is that uh, in a vineyard hall where the orchestra is, is in center, center, and then basically the audience is surrounding, sitting on the, almost on the walls of the hall, I would describe it that, that we are always like looking at the music because basically it's kind of orchestra is down there. You can think also that they are, many of these halls are, are if you look at the, the section uh, drawings, they are a little bit like a bowl. So the orchestra is sitting in the t- on the bottom of the bowl, and then the, the audience kind of on the walls of this bowl. And unfortunately, m- in most of these halls, like the the sound is always staying on stage, and it's in front of you. As we are missing these lateral reflections, in in most of them, uh, we we don't have this this kind of, and they are playing louder and and so on. The hall is not so much excited, and we don't have this kind of enveloping reverb. So it's kind of always, it stays in, in front of you, the auditory image. And that's why I'm, I'm calling them as, as looking at the music. But then in a, in a good shoebox hall, where you have a lot of lateral reflections, high ceiling and maybe balconies, which are also giving you reflections, then you are much better enveloped by the music. So you are kind of inside the music uh, when the orchestra is playing. And then because you have the enveloping surrounding reverb, and that's kind of the main difference between these. And of course, there are different flavors of, of these differences, but that's kind of what we have found out based on the horse that we have studied. And what's your prefer- preference as a listener? Um, Maybe it depends preference. on the style of the music, as you said before. Uh, yeah, a little bit, but I, I still prefer the shoebox horse and this kind of enveloping reverb because that's also what I explained about the dynamics and the dynamics responsiveness the, the responsiveness to kind of dynamic changes in, in music and then pianissimos and fortissimos then they are usually also larger in this where you have the lateral reflections and so in this shoebox horse and they are kind of mild in, in, in this vineyard horse but then uh, that's purely sound then if you look at like the visual aspects we are basically visual animals. So there I understand the vineyard horse quite well because it's kind of really people are gathering around the orchestra and, and the visual, you see the orchestra pretty well and then the impression is that, that that it's kind of, it can be, impression can be that even though there is like more than a thousand people that it's actually quite small, the hall, because the orchestra is in center and then, then everybody is close. Then it's also some people value that that you can see the orchestra from different directions. You can go behind the orchestra 
even though the sound is, is probably not so perfect, but you can see the, what the conductor is doing much better. But that's a different experience and, and kind of a different way of, of going to concerts. We acousticians usually think only like the sound, but then it's, it's kind of, it's really like, okay, those people go there for because they want to, for example, see that what the orchestra is doing when they are playing. And, and then you can see much better, for example, behind the orchestra. And we always have to remember that that not all the concert goers are really huge fans of music. There are there are some spouses who are there only for like social <laughs> means means that they are it's kind of their weekly routine. They have a season ticket, and and then one of them is actually really like enthusiastic of music, but the other one is that okay, it's okay. I, I like to listen to music, but but I'm I'm really the best part of the, the concert is is the intermission where where we see our friends and. And, and we can have a glass of wine and, and, and it's kind of festive event. And there is always this kind of audience as well. So we have really different aspects. And then if the architecture is really great and, and then there is also something to see and, and, and some other aspects, then those are also kind of aspects that, that, that make a difference. I agree. And also some, not everybody, not all the audience will know every piece of music that the orchestra or the artist will Will play and at some point yes i agree you forget about of, about the audio when you're close to the orchestra because obviously you want to see all the details what they're doing the way they're the playing uh how fast they're moving so you don't mind the trade-off another aspect still is is there is, is kind of the musicians and conductors so uh, that's also i see one of the reasons that there has been so many of these vineyard and, and this kind of surround halls is, is especially conductors they they are kind of big uh, big players who want to be in the center of the ac- action and that's kind of their job they have 100 people that they are guiding and then also like a thousand people around them that they are watching them basically watching them then if they are in this in the center point of the hall that's kind of the easiest way of taking getting contact to audience because you have audience everywhere and then that's probably also one of the reasons that, that we have been seeing more of these kind of types of halls that, that they kind of give the better, uh, better connection to the musicians and the, the audience. And is the stage also better designed for acoustics? Obviously, there's the science of stage acoustics that has improved recently because of the, all those reprodu- reproduction techniques. I think, I think yes, yes. But then, yeah, one one uh, thing which I uh, still uh, want to point out here is that 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 the uh, the the one yard halls they actually have quite big difference between the seats. So if you are behind the orchestra, sound is actually quite different, and then it it might be hard to hear the soloist, which is especially singers, which are singing to another direction. And then on the side of the orchestra, it's, it's quite different on balconies. That might be interesting to somebody, not not if you have a season ticket that you're always sitting in the same, but but some people I know, for example, in Helsinki, we have such a hall and some people like to kind of sample the, the hall from, from different seats in different concerts. While in, in, in a in a that kind of classical shoebox hall, it's not the same sound, but it's kind of similar sound. The orchestra is in front of you always, and then, of course, if you are on a balcony, it's a little bit different. Or if you are back in the hall, there is more reverb than in front, or there is less direct sound, and then you kind of hear reverb more. But they, they the differences are, are smaller usually, and that's kind of something that we have to kind of also understand that, that these are the differences as well. <laughs> 